So I want to have some fun with you today, even as we try to learn together some things. The president of Stanford asked a group of presidents um, several years ago this question. How long do you think college students can focus on a lecture, on the lecturer, before they begin to fade away? How long? I heard 10 minutes. Five. I heard 20. Uh-huh. So some of you all are saying you're about to fade away on me right now. I got that. I got that. I got that. All right. The, uh, it's about eight minutes. All right. Now, what would the neuroscientists say would be the, the maximum amount of time that someone can, an adult, can focus in a lecture? What do you think? 17. I heard 17 minutes. Four. My God, you're going to fade on me in a minute. <laughs> it's actually 20 minutes at most. All right. Now, it doesn't mean you don't get most of the lecture. It just means that by some point, you start thinking about what you have to do this afternoon. You know, and all of you are great, successful learners and educators. So you know how to look at me as if you're really listening when you're really thinking about something else. I know that. One of the approaches that my campus uses and many will use in innovation when talking about teaching and learning in the classroom or in these settings is to have an interactive approach. If I simply sit here, stand here and talk, at some point you're going to begin to give out, give out on me. How many of you love math? This is a pretty nerdy group, not bad. <laughs> my campus is a place where math rocks. UMBC, first of all, my campus made history, I have to say this everywhere I go, in that we were the number 16 seat, the worst in the, in the dance, in the, right? And we beat the number one seat, UVA. Give us a big round of applause for that. <laughs> But you should know we have a very nerdy campus. It is a campus with students from 100 countries, um, undergrad through PhD, and math rocks on my campus. So much so that uh, we are the number one feeder to the National Security Agency. In our area, students, you were talking about, Jeremy, somebody was talking about the head of, of, of higher ed was talking about the fact that high school students can get this work. In, in the Baltimore, Washington corridor, students can begin working at places like the National Security Agency in about 10th grade. And by the time they're 16 or 17, they actually, when they come to me as freshmen, they actually have security clearances already. So I like telling the parents, uh, they're are, they are, they are spies all around. They're watching your child all the time. Parents like that. It keeps the kids from doing it because you never know who is working for NSA or not. But here, here's the point that I want to make. We were also last year the 2017 National Cybersecurity Champions. Give us a big round of applause for that. And it's because of all that issues with that. Everybody has a story, and each of you understands that who you are today is in large part determined, has already been determined by who you were as a child, the experiences you had as a child. And as we think about our students, whether they are 18 or 40, all of those experiences throughout their lives will have an impact on what they can do as they come to us to learn as we talk about teaching and learning. I, I brought a copy of my, my newest book, which is on my experience in the civil rights movement in Birmingham. But Baltimore is what I call, by the way, the Upper South, the Upper South. One day we think like Philadelphia, the next day we think like Richmond. But I grew up in the Deep South. Y'all the Deep South too, I want you to know that. If you didn't know it, y'all the Deep South, all right. Well, I grew up in Alabama, I can say that. I grew up in my beloved Birmingham. And we are definitely Deep South. And, and this book is about my having the experience of marching with Dr. King and spending a tough week in jail as a re result. But how those experiences as a child leader in the civil rights movement shaped my thinking about education and about producing leaders and in particular about producing scientists. So my campus now is, the, it, even though it's a predominantly white campus, 50 some percent white, 30 percent um, Asian of Asian backgrounds and probably almost 18% uh, black. We're the number one producer of African Americans who go on to get MD, PhDs. Give us a huge round of applause for that. We've actually produced more blacks who've gone on to get MD, PhDs in any university in the history of America. Now that's, I mean, that means above Howard and my beloved Hampton and those kinds of places. And I'm gonna talk about how we were able to do that, but how we can talk about math and science at different levels. And on the cover, what it looks like artwork is really HIV. And the idea is this, that uh, this is the three-dimensional structure. Who's in science in the room? Who teaches science? You'll appreciate this. This is from a biochemistry lab on my campus, a Howard Hughes lab. And uh, my scientist, who's a Howard Hughes investigator, actually uh, has identified two parts of the HIV structure. 
and that those parts have been identified and so drugs have been developed to knock out those parts of the the virus and it's because of work like this that people with HIV are not necessarily going to get AIDS. Give this kind of science a round of applause for the idea. It's, it is exactly what that, and when we talk about why STEM is important, it is important because it is about life and death in many cases. Uh, it is important because it's about the intelligence community and defense of our country. It's important because of everything around us. I mean, the question that we have to be able to ask all the time is that students say, well, why, why is STEM important? Well, everything, if you look around from the lights to the air conditioning to his doing the taping right there to your watch, all these things involve STEM. Wherever you go, there's STEM. Um, I was sitting in the back of church in the middle of the week, not wanting to be there. What kid wants to be in church in the middle of the week? And uh, my parents have placated me by letting me do the two things I love most, math and eating. So I'm eating M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts, you know that kind. <laughs> and all of a sudden the guy at the lectern says, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our babies know the difference between right and wrong. And quite frankly, I was, I said, who is that guy? And of course his name was Dr. King. And my only thought was I was tired of those hand-me-down books. After the white kids had used them, they'd give them to us, they put brown paper bags around them, and they'd say, here are your books. And my parents couldn't buy my books because nobody could have new books in the school because then you'd be different from everybody else. So it was a psychologically damaging situation to be told by our society that we were not as good as. And while we had some wonderful teachers, we didn't have the resources. And so I was especially interested in what he was saying. And this is what he said. He said, you must know that tomorrow can be better than today. That we don't have to accept the way things are in our great democracy because we should be first class citizens. I'll never forget going home and saying, I want to march. And my parents said, no. I told them they were hypocrites. They told me to go to my room. At that time, you didn't tell your parents that they were hypocrites. You know that, right? Uh, but the next morning they came in, they had not slept. They had been praying all night. And they said, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We didn't trust the people who would be over you because if you march, you will go to jail. Now I was 12. And I appreciate it now more than ever, but I will tell you, after that awful week in which they treated us like animals, literally animals without the bathrooms, awful, we, in the middle of the week, heard Dr. King saying this, what you do this day will have an impact on children who have not yet been born. And so when I think about STEM education, when I think about your becoming teachers, you need, it's so important for us to put all of that in perspective. That experience changed America. That experience of that civil rights approach, that march on Washington, all those things led to the legislation, civil rights legislation, voting rights, higher ed. Now let me show you how significant that period was. How many of you in this room are the first in your families to go to college? Let me see your hands. How many are the first in your first generation to go to college? Let me see your hands. So you are a pretty privileged group because what percent, first of all, of Americans, do you think in 1965 had graduated from college? What do you think? What percent of Americans were college graduates in 1965? I heard 20, I heard 30. 12, anybody else? It was only, it was only 10%. Now, at that time we broke everything down into black and white. Today we talk about all the different groups, but at that time everything was really black and white. I can prove it. How many of you remember black and white TV? Oh, you look good then. You really look good. Because my students would say, TV's always been in color. Wait a minute. You look real good if you remember black and white TV. I remember when we got the color TV in the early 60s, I thought it meant a TV where you'd have colored people on the TV. Wait a minute. That's how the world has changed so much. But the fact is that, so what percent of whites had a college degree in 1965? What do you think? If 10% of all Americans had a college degree, what percent of whites? 90. You think a lot of white people, don't you? Ooh. That's a joke, folks. That's a joke. Wait a minute. <laughs> out of the 10%, uh, I'm talking about just the 10%. No, 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 no. What percent? No, no. You're, 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 I'm, I'm not being clear. Then let me put it on me. Uh, it's not, I don't mean all those with college degrees. You're absolutely right. Of those with college degrees, you just made a very, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, what percent of Americans in general? Not for the 10%, all right? It's an excellent, I get your interpretation. No, it's what percent of Americans. When you look at all Americans, all right, and you think about this idea, what percent of whites had a college degree? 25 percent, 5 percent? Now, 10% overall now, think about it, it's got to be more than that 10, right? The, right? It's only 11 percent. Only 11 percent. Everybody thought so many whites had college degree. No, no. And what percent of blacks had a college degree, huh? 
Three, uh uh-huh, I've seen two and three. Most of whom had gone to HBCUs in the Deep South, right? Um, Okay, now what, what am I saying? So in 1965, 90% of Americans of all races never thought their kids would get a college degree, a four-year degree, okay? Now today, they didn't think they would get a two-year degree. Now today, we know almost half of Americans start off in community colleges, half, 40-some high percent, all right? And when you look now today, let's just talk for a minute. What percent of Americans today have completed college, a four-year degree, let me ask? What do you think? I heard 40%. 50. 50? What'd you say? 30%. Yes, 30. And we've finally gotten to the point where 30% of Americans have a four year degree. And if you add on those with a double A, AA degree, it's, all, it's 40. It's 40%. So we talk about international um, comparisons. We look at the two and the four together, and then we say 40, okay? But now break it down quickly. What percent of whites have a college degree? Four year degree. 65%, anybody else? 70%? Mm. It's only 37%. Only 37 So this group is quite privileged. You had parents who were teachers or did something. You are very privileged in America. When I saw, because normally in, in any room, more than half will say they first generation college. You are the privileged ones, clearly, in the South. All right, and in America. Because only 37% of whites is actually only, what percent of blacks? It's about 22%. What's the fastest growing group in our country? Hispanics. Hispanics, fastest growing. One in every four Americans will be Hispanic in the next 20 years, okay? Only 14%. And then what is the highest achieving group in America? Undeniably, Asian, right? So you put it all together and what I'm telling you is even today, two thirds of American families have not had anyone graduate from a four year institution. And when you add on, as we were just talking, literally 60% from a two or four year institution. So that gives you a sense of where we are. Now, when I'm talking to my friends of every race, they will say, Freeman, that couldn't be true. Everybody I know has a degree. Duh. (laughs) Faculty, no faculty. Teachers, no teachers. Lawyers, no lawyers. And plumbers who make more money than any of y'all, no plumbers, all right? (laughs) So it just depends on who you're around. You get my point? Now, why am I saying that? Because in the 60s, here's the big challenge. In the 60s, the probability, even after we had the Higher Education Act, even after people started going to college, even by 1970, the probability of a child coming from a low income, the bottom 25% of our population economically, of any race, the probability of that kid getting a four-year degree was under 10%. What do you think it is today? If they're in that bottom quarter of the economy, it's not even 15%. So the number one, as I go around the world from France to South Africa, the first point people make as I talk about the greatness of our country is, but what about your poor people of any race? And it is a challenge that we face for all races at that level, all right? And the fact is, for people of color, there's a disproportionate impact on those groups. Now, with that said, let's get to some math. Here is a math problem for you. 27 children in a class, 29 children. There are 29 children in a class, okay? 20 have dogs, 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? How long do we have? You, you, mean, you mean to solve it? That's funny. So, so first of all, do not holler out an answer. Do not holler out an answer. If you, are, if you holler out an answer, you owe me $50. And I do collect. Do not holler out an answer. Now, I start with that as context for this reason. First of all, I'll say the problem again. Who wants to say the problem for me? Let's say it again. Uh-huh. A dog and a cat. Give a round of applause for, for saying, give a round of applause for that. So, so some of you, if you're teaching college or whatever, I give this problem to people at NSA, I give this problem to people at GE, PhDs, and many get it wrong. And the reason I give it, I should tell you, I've had the privilege of working on the international math and science competition. Um, if you don't like standardized tests for years, I was working on the problems for the math SAT. And I'm giving you this problem because it has, for those of you who teach upper level math or something, I'm still saying it's not, it's not beneath you. Because the problem does two things. It requires layers of thinking, 
But number two, I can use it as a kind of metacognitive approach to thinking about teaching and learning. What do I mean? There are three groups of people in this room right now. There are those who got A's in math who are dying to get the answer to that problem because they want to show everybody just how smart they are. And they may not be, they're not the face of it, but believe me, they are really working on it because they want to be cool about it, but they want to make it clear they, they know how to do this problem. There are those on the other end who are saying, why would he give us a math problem? Because it's rare that a person in a lecture will give a math problem, right? They're saying, why would he try to embarrass me? And then there are those in that group who also said, I hope he doesn't call on me, all right? I know, I, I can see your faces, all right? Then there are those in the middle who are saying, I'll try it, but I'm not that good in math, okay? And I might ask the question, well, how long do you have? Well, I want you to think about it throughout my talk. And what's different about this approach is, I am not, even then, I'm not going to give you the answer. When I look at what happens in Singapore, uh, or in the countries that are so far ahead of us, one of the really interesting approaches is, they teach children to not be frustrated when they can't solve the problem. And they teach them that the interesting problems are not solved like that, okay? Now keep that thought and that, and that. Now the second, by the way, let me ask you something. If I said I would give somebody $1,000, if they could stand right now and give me the answer, how many of you would be willing to stand? Stand up if you're ready to get $1,000. Stand up, let me see who you are. If you're ready right now, let me see who you are. Stand up right now. Okay, now let me, keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. Oh, if you, come on, keep standing. Now, here's the one caveat. If you're wrong, you gotta give me $500. <laughs> Very good, okay, all right. So now, uh, 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 and so you got your $500, you got your checkbooks, right? Certified? That's a joke, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but give them a hand for their confidence. Give them a hand for their confidence. There's a reason I did that too though. There's a reason I did it too. When I said the thousand dollars, everybody's face looked a little more interested, right? And what is my point? We all like incentives. You know, when we talk about money for education, we need money. You have to have money to have conferences, money working on salaries and all those kind of things. We, and students need to know that whatever they're doing in math has some connection to life. You know, for the geometry teachers in the room, uh, what geom I've taught math 40 years. And as a kid, I would, the teacher would give us 10 problems, and I'd say, give us 10 more, teacher, and the whole kid class would go, shut up, Freeman. I got kicked for math every day, all right? That's why I like my campus, because math rocks at UMBC. But, but here's, here's what I want you to think about. For the, who teaches geometry? Anybody teach geometry? Who's taught geometry before? Anybody? So, so, so the typical question asked in a geometry class, when you get to those statements and reasons and all that is, uh, how come I got to do this? When am I going to ever use this? And what we are taught to tell people is, this will teach you how to think. That's what we've been taught all along. This teaches you how to think. Now, in truth, it really does help you a lot in terms of reasoning and all of that, and QED and all that. But the kid is thinking, I already know how to think. I think this sucks. That's what I think. Right? <laughs> the best geometry I've ever saw, so in terms of the teaching of it, was in, in L.A., in a South Central LA with the GED program with people who were all over 30 who were building a green construction house. And they were learning the Pythagorean theorem and they threw the, they didn't even know it was called the Pythagorean theorem. But they were learning relationships between length and width and that hypotenuse by doing it. We, we, the more we can connect it to life, the more opportunities we have, it makes all the difference in the world. I want you to think about this. One last story. My mother grew up in a place called Wetumpka, Alabama, outside of Montgomery. I'm from the big city, Birmingham, but I spent my summers between Massachusetts because they wanted me to see what it'd be like to be in class with white kids, and then the rest of the summer with my country cousins chopping cotton. And mama grew up there, and she said when she grew up at age 12, she had a choice of either working in a hot cotton field or going to work in a wealthy home, obviously a wealthy white home. And she wanted to see how rich white people lived. And the woman was very kind to her and could see that my mother was, was intrigued by the books. The, the house had a library at a time when children of color had no public library. And the only book in my mother's house, a wonderful book, was the Bible. And so mother would be looking at the books and the woman finally said, Maggie, let's choose a book and let's talk about it when you read it. And had her go home and she would read part of it and, she, and write me something on it and they would discuss it. And all of a sudden my mama's friends got really upset with her because they would say, Maggie, come on outside and play. And mother would say, no, I, I really want to keep reading this book. And here was the defining difference 
and it's at the heart of what I say to you today about math, of all things. It is this. She said the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she loved the experience. And the more she loved the experience, the more of it she did. It was like, a, uh, it was like the real Housewives of Atlanta. Some whatever, when people get all these silly shows, right? You know, but she was in the book that same way, right? Now, here's my point. Her girlfriends was so upset because they didn't understand why she wouldn't come out and play. And she then decided to watch them read. And she saw them moving their lips. They only read when they had to. And they'd read a part of the book and they're frowning because it's hard to do. And they push the book aside. And what did they say? This isn't interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because no, it's frustrated, exactly. Because what is interesting if it is frustrating to you because you can't do it? You, we learn to do by doing. And when people ask me, I have two books before this on raising smart black boys in science and another on raising smart black girls in science at 20 some years old still selling because quite frankly, the lessons are the same. I, I studied 100 families, African American families of boys, of sons, and then of girls, of, of kids who have been in our special program to produce scientists. And the question is, what did you do to make a difference? at an early age, and at the, at the heart of it, there were several things. Uh, faith was important, the idea, quite frankly. So I start off saying, in a public institution, that this is not about my proselytizing. Systemic, systematically, looking at these kids, they had some strong faith, some strong background, and being in church with other adults, because what we know is sometimes other people can tell your kid and they'll listen to it, and when you say it, they don't listen to you, right? And so reinforcing positive, positive role models, but, but critically, they were learning to read at an early age. Uh, Legos were important for children. Legos for girls and boys. And, and the key is this, that the better they were reading, the more confident they became. And so when people say to me, what do we need to do to produce kids who are gonna be scientists or mathematicians? I, they're always surprised when I start by saying, start with reading and thinking. Because you see, we don't discuss engineering problems or chemistry problems um, in, or physics problems in words, I mean in numbers. We discuss them in words. Science, upper level science is all about language skills. My mama went on to valedictorian of her little country school, went on to college, worked her way through college, cleaning tables and everything and playing basketball and she became an English teacher because she saw that, that somehow the, the better read she was, the better she could write, but also the more comfortable she was, the more facile she was with language skills. And people would say, that's a smart little girl. Okay, it's an unusual little girl. And one of her favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote during the 20th century Harlem Renaissance, and in her book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, my mama would be washing dishes and, and quoting Zora Neale Hurston. I'd be rolling my eyes. and mama, why are you doing that? You know, you don't appreciate your mama almost until she leaves, until she dies, right? It's the human experience. But ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men. And my mother would say, and women. And the point was this, two groups of people in our society, people whose dreams are fulfilled. Everybody in here is blessed enough to have skills, degrees, jobs. You're respected as teachers and college professors and whatever. On the other hand, there are all these people who had those dreams, and in the words of Langston Hughes, have seen those dreams deferred. They don't reach the goal. Why? Fundamentally, education. Where would anybody in here be if they had not gotten that education? What's interesting about her becoming an English teacher is years later something came out called the new math. Anybody old enough to remember the new math? Oh, you all really look good. Now you're really looking good, yeah, yeah. The one reason the new math did not succeed is that we in colleges went to the schools as if we were the only experts and we were gonna tell people what to do. We did not realize that K through 12, pre-K through 12 teachers are the experts on the children and the challenges that children face and can think as well as anybody else, but we had this condescending attitude, we we're trying to teach set theory, and people got really scared, all right? And it, the distance between those enjoying math and those who did not became even worse. And, and, but my mother decided she was gonna go back. Everybody was scared of that math. 
and she became that math teacher. So she was math and English specialist, and I was her guinea pig. And the reason I can write questions for the SAT and stuff is that I was, I was rooted in the humanities and language as much as I was solving word, math word problems. So if you ask the typical student about word problems, they say, give me that equation, 5x plus 5 equals 50. Don't give me that word problem. And that has everything to do with those reading and thinking skills and needing more and more practice, all right? And so when I think about what we have done on my campus, I want you to look at my TED talk. It is on this notion of what does it take for students to succeed in science. What percent of Americans do you think who start with a major in science at two-year or four-year institutions in STEM, what percent do you actually think graduate? It's, and now at, at, at community colleges, it's just about that. It really is in STEM. At the four-year institutions overall for, uh, uh, for minorities, and I was chairing this national group on underrepresentation, it's only about 20%. We'll make it. We'll succeed. What percent of whites, though, do you think will make it? Who start in STEM? 40. It's about 31%. And then for the highest achieving group, Asians? 60. You believe it or not, it's only 40%. All right. Now, here is the, here is the counterintuitive and stunning finding. We all said, well, it's a K through 12 problem. Well, we were all, we had a couple superintendents, but it was mainly people from Harvard and MIT to University of Texas to Miami Dade Community College. And we all said, well, it's just a K through 12 problem. But then we were challenged to look at the data. Because first of all, you see colleges, four year institutions blame two year institutions. <laughs> And colleges blame high schools, and high schools blame the elementary schools, and elementary schools blame the family, and the husband says it's the wife's problem in the problem. It's her part of the problem. It's the wife's family. We all blame somebody, right? We are a finger-pointing society. We know that. But we decided to be really transformational and to say, well, let's look in the mirror. And here's what we found that was so stunning. Um, the higher the test scores of students, AP exams, SATs, ACTs, the more prestigious the university the student attends, the greater the probability the student who starts in STEM will leave it within the first year. So all those who go to the most prestigious of places, um, who start off and everybody's bragging, they went this place, that place, and whatever, and they start off as doctors, they become great lawyers. That's a joke, folks, but it's true. It really is. I was talking to the head of one of the big national agencies, and she said, after you just told my story, I had a perfect score. I went to the most prestigious of institutions in America. We know what that is. And um, I, had perfect, I had a perfect SAT. And the first semester, I got a C in chemistry. And I went home and told my parents, I love the humanities. Okay? <laughs> And I became English major and then law school. I was talking to a group of college presidents, brilliant Shakespeare scholar said he just told the truth, said I was excellent as a student, and quite frankly, I started off in um, double E, electrical engineering, and I ended up in English, single E. You get it? <laughs> All right. Now, how many of you know somebody in your college who started off in something in STEM and changed their majors? Raise your hands. Uh-huh. See, now, you know, now I can really ask you how many of y'all did just the same thing, all right? But I'm not going to embarrass you like that, but it happens, in, I mean, to the highest achieving people. One of the things I want you to think about, and my TED Talk has gotten almost a million hits from people who say, yeah, you're telling my story. From around the world, you're telling my story, because I really wanted to be a doctor. I really wanted to be an engineer, and I got wiped out in that math course, right? And I had to change my major, right? So you start there. But there are others, I've got a lot of my colleagues around who are saying, you've been teaching 40 years, why would you criticize us like that? Because it's the truth. It is the truth. That we, in fact, quite frankly, we don't even expect most students to succeed in STEM at two years and four years college. We, because we haven't seen it. It's not that we're bad people, we just haven't seen it. What do I mean? If you look at any place, if you look at the number of seats in the second year of chemistry or math compared to the first year, we plan for about a third. Everybody does it. In fact, we'd have a problem. If, I mean, the reason we are being looked at by so many places right now is that we have redesigned what we do in chemistry and math and physics to, to focus less on the lecture and more on collaborative learning, active, interactive, use of technology, use of analytics, using problems from the biotech companies on my campus. And with real-time feedback, with something that some would call sacrilegious, which says that if you've got a, um, at midterm time right now in math, if you've got a D, okay, in any math course at midterm, anybody in here knows it's over. If something special doesn't happen, if you are below that C at midterm, that dog won't hunt, okay? Yet we have to keep moving on. 
And the challenge is how do we give faculty the support to not only go laser focused on what it is the kid didn't do, the person didn't get, to get at least up to a C or B, but also to have the opportunity for the time beyond that classroom even, where through online, through tutoring, through other things, the person keeps building the skills for the first half. Because what we don't do in high school, in middle school, in college, is to understand that by the midpoint, we can just about predict who will succeed and who will not. And we know it because everything is sequentially based in math and science. And, and yet, this is not an indictment of teachers. I mean, you've got to finish certain work. We know that. The question is, how can school systems and institutions rethink the support we give to teachers and, learn, and faculty and students in looking at creative approaches to identifying those concepts that people didn't grasp so that we can strengthen their backgrounds and give them another test. Now, a lot of old timers will say, well, that's not fair because that's not fair to the first students. Well, let's get over what's fair or not. It's about what, the, what does the student know at the end. I like to say that the English people have it right. I mean, those who teach, how many of you remember in your first class in English that you got your first paper back and you thought you could write really well and they just marked it up in red. There was red everywhere. And you're going, oh my God, I'm going to flunk this course. Remember that? Everybody has that experience. And you know, whether it's about coherence or about grammar or about structure, all kinds of things. And you get it back and then they give you suggestions. And then you come back, then you have to go back and rewrite the paper. And the next time, you still get some red, but less red, right? And you're learning things. And you, do, you go through iterations. And throughout the semester, you're going through this iterative process of learning how to write better by getting feedback and redoing and rethinking and learning other things. By the end of the semester, even though you may have been getting all these red ink papers throughout the semester, if you can write a literate paper at the end, you can get an A. Because by that time, you know how to write. Well, if we could think that way, rather than being so linear, and so strictly mathematical as to say you got a 60 and a, and a, and, a, and a whatever and the next set and you average them and that's your grade but to think rather about the concepts and about the notion that perhaps we can loosen up some to make sure students are getting to the level they need because here's the other part we found if students get C's even in chemistry on my campus there's no way they can go on and get B's in the next level Again, because everything is sequentially based. Think about it. Let me give you an example. That happens, you can say, well, I know somebody got a C. Yeah, there, there, there's some, a few examples. But for the most part, this is the point. Go back to elementary school. If the kid didn't learn to subtract and multiply well, and you've moved, moved on to longhand division, it ain't gonna work. That dog won't hurt. Because they're still back trying to multiply when you're trying to get to the vision. So there has to be a way of continuing to build the multiplication skills and the subtraction skills even as you introduce a new concept. And the challenge for the teacher is you've got all these people at different levels and the name of the game for those innovative places, elementary through college, will be supplemental work to help that teacher to work with kids wherever they are. Now, you might say, well, you're a college, college guy and you work with that. We work as much with pre-K through 12 as anybody in the country. Um, I'm in somebody's school at least once every couple of weeks, two to three weeks, um, and I like like third and fourth grade and sixth and seventh. And I'm looking at children learning certain concepts. And I'm talking to our State Department of Education about the approach we use in the standardized test. Do you have Common Core in this state? Do you have Common Core? You have somewhat. Okay, well, I, I was very involved in the Common Core, and so we know it's more rigorous. And when people complain about it, let me just say, the standards of the Common Core are typical for the standards of any prestigious private school. They've always been like that. Very deep thinking. And when you go to other countries, you see that. So we're finally giving middle class and lower income kids the standards, but the question is, are we giving them the support? That's the other part of it. How do we give them the support to do it when they're there? Now, by the way, how many of you at this point have solved that math problem? Raise your hands if you think you solved it. Let me see it, okay. How many of you willing to bet me that $1,000 with the 500? Suppose I made it $100. Everybody who's willing to give me $50 if they're wrong, stand up, let me see who you are. If you're willing to give me $50 if you're wrong, you get $100 if you're right, let me see you. Okay, give them a round of applause, okay. 
Give him a round of applause. Now here's the next math problem for you. How many of you must, listen to this math problem, how many of you must be wrong in order for me to know I come out ahead? There's, okay. There's the interesting math. You see, when I do math, I get goosebumps. I get goosebumps, I always have. So when I'm talking to that little third grade boy, and he's going, you crazy, you get goosebumps, yeah. I mean, we must bring excitement to math and science. It's tough enough as it is, but we have to get people to understand there's something great about embracing this challenge. It makes all the difference in the world. And this is why I tell you about the pre-K through 12 in, in relationship to the university, what we call developmental math and reading, really a, a middle school skills. We're talking middle school skills. We're talking about pre-algebra and algebra, okay? And so when I hear that somebody is in developmental math, and that is probably 40-some percent of all Americans and, and literally 65% of kids of color. And when I know that if you start in developmental math, the probability of getting a college degree is about 10%, a four-year degree is about 10%, then it says to me that all of us, higher ed and K-12, have to be working together to figure out how to help those kids learn to read well and to do fundamental pre-algebra and word problems. Because if you're going to go into anything in STEM, you need that as a foundation. Whether you're going to chemistry or physics or engineering, any of those, in, even the math requirements for our computing. We, a third of my students are in something in technology. And the thing I wanted to tell you about at the, at the, at the undergrad level, two and four year, that more and more enlightened institutions are taking technology across the disciplines. So for us, it is everything from digital humanities to imaging and digital arts to geographic information systems, to obviously business technology administration. There are ways because as, as your leader of the state was talking about the jobs and technology, it's not that everybody has to have a computer science degree, but they have to have some fundamental comfort level in technology and using it. And so the name of the game, the cybersecurity is one. The other one is data science, data science. And, and that data science has to do with the fact that everything that has so much data, we have to have ways of being able to manipulate the data. And data science really is at the intersection of computing and statistics. And there, there are two-year kinds of efforts as well as four-year. Now, I will tell you this. I would agree everybody shouldn't have to go the way of a four-year institution. I was talking at a school in one part of my state, and all the kids were there, and the teachers were there, and the, and the parents were there. And this guy got up at the end, a young man, he was 16, 17, he said, Dr. Bowski, I want you to tell me the truth. He said, I hate school. I hate it. I get B's because my daddy makes me get B's, all right? He said, but they want me to go to college, major in history or something, and I don't want to do it. And he said, should I be made to go to college? Should I be made to go to college? Now, what would be your response? You and me, the kids are looking at me. The kid, the young man wants an honest answer. His daddy is really looking at me. His teachers are looking at me. His counselor is looking at me as if to say, don't you dare say the wrong thing, right? So, all right, I want to know one here. I want each of you, one person, to tell me. I want you to stand and tell me what you would tell that young man. Let's start over here. Who wants to do it? What advice would you give them? How would you respond? Now, don't let me leave Arkansas saying y'all risk adverse. I mean, you, you got to take a chance. There's no right and wrong answer. Who wants to do it? Yes, ma'am. Give her a round of applause for her courage, first of all. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would tell him to try to give it, give it a try. Mm -hmm. Because the experience you have in college is different from what you do in, in high school. Okay. Okay. And I tell him that there's also people there who are tutoring you who mm -hmm. can help you. And how would you know what you can do if you don't try? Right. You can't, try. Right. You can't succeed yes. if you don't first try. Yes. Yeah, give her a hand. Give her a hand. Now, my response is, this was a uh, upper middle class kid with educated parents, and he was making bees without trying. So he knew he could do the work. He was saying, I don't like just sitting in class. He said, it's boring sitting in a class all day long. How many of you all know that a lot of your students are bored? Tell the truth. I mean, anybody in here who doesn't admit that children tend to be bored often is not being honest with yourselves. 
it's really hard because some of y'all bored right now as I'm talking. I know you are. You just know how to look like you're interested. Wait a minute. But, but young people want movement, right? I mean, it's, you know, you've got to think, I mean, they've got to have ways of movement. If to sit there and to be proper is not what children like to do. And that is the part of the structure. I had my son we had ADHD and I had him in a special school and they always had them in integrating the work, whether it was geometry or whatever, in nature. They were outside all the time doing stuff. I mean, I was saying, I wish every kid could have that. Now, he, here's what, what's your answer over here? Let me see what you would say. Somebody, what would you say? What answer would you give to the student? Somebody, come on. There's more than one path. Yes. Really yes. That doesn't require a four year degree because I've got, I have that child. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Who has a two year degree from the eight plus last week? Yes. She makes more than I make. Yes. Are you happy doing it? Yes. Yes. Give, give her a round of applause. <laughs> yes. And then over here, one response. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I would say that's the wrong question. Okay. I would want to reframe the question okay. and I would validate his concerns about being bored. Yes. Uh -huh. Like, you know, I tell my girl, you have expensive taste right now in your children. Uh -huh. So what type of uh, occupation do you need? Yes. What kind of problems can you solve yes. that will also support the type of life you want to have? <laughs> yeah. Give a round of applause for that. So, I mean, all of you have very legitimate approaches. All of you have. Now, let me, let me tell you what I did. Because keep in mind, those parents, mm -hmm. educated parents, the teachers and the counselors definitely wanted me to say he should be going on to college to a four-year college. Let me just put it out there, okay? This is a very advantaged family. They had the money to go wherever, okay? But I, I, I took a chance and I said this. Well, let's start with this. What do you want to do? You see, to me, you want to start by asking the upper, what is it you want to do? Let's get a sense. You know, we need children to know that we care about what they think and what they might dream about doing, what they aspire to do, what they like, just to see how we can integrate that with what we think is important for them. And he said, I like building houses. Okay, I said, so you like construction? He said, yep. I said, well, what about, and I mentioned a couple of community colleges that have great construction management programs. I said, what about, and I was looking at his parents to see how they were dealing with this. I said, what about, going to, and I named a couple of places, that have these incredible construction management programs that also have major internships along the way, so you're learning things in the classroom, but you're also out building at the same time. You're seeing how the two connect. And his eyes lit up, okay? I said, because I bet you this, you will go to one of those places, and you'll, get, you'll do really well, and you'll learn a lot, and then you'll begin to see on the job that the people often who are the supervisors have more education. I said, and you're such a leader, I know you want to be a leader, and you'll do what it takes to be a leader, and you'll go on and get that degree, if it's not in construction management, in business or something like that, and he appreciated it. And his dad later on said, you know, I hadn't thought about that, because we always think there's one path. And somebody said, well, it's not about one path. You know, so much so that, let me tell you what my campus has done. We now have a training company Beyond the regular, that we got about 14,000 in the regular programs, undergrad through PhD, we have a training company with maybe seven or 8,000 more students who are adults, sometimes veterans, sometimes already with a degree, and they want to get into technology. So our 18-month boot camp, for example, in cyber, leads them, just 18 months, leads them to be called a cyber analyst without a college degree, and they start with $80,000. Now, when I said that to some of my faculty, they said, let me go over there and get that certificate somehow, right? But I mean, but the idea is that there are many certificate programs that can get people great jobs. And one of the challenges for every region is to say, well, what's in this area? You know, what are, what are the things we can do to uh, give students the certificates and the badges and the competencies they need, all right? Because this is what I like to think about. Uh, it's the notion of the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. I wish I had said that I didn't. It's Jim Collins in Good to Great. The genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. We in, a, in our country, we tend to think, well, you're going to either go to this kind of place or you're going to go to that kind of place. But I want people to think about the idea that somebody can start in, in a, a training program of some kind at a two-year institution or at a four-year, and they have opportunities to go back and forth. We see a number of students and on my campus and other places who will get one degree, and they'll see some program at, at Cadenceville Community College, and they'll go over and take that program also. So it's possible to go back and forth, and we've got to stop thinking that it's all linear, 
and that you also go right through to get a bachelor's degree. There are many jobs that will allow other than that. The other point I want to make about the genius of the end, you hear me talking about math and science and engineering, but when we talk about the importance of STEM, we should never underestimate the importance of the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Give those disciplines a round of applause. The arts, humanities, and social sciences. See, because I don't want to train somebody to go to NSA who is not ethical. You get my point? I don't want people to have the technical skills that can be used against humankind. You get my point? Uh, I have one of my uh, graduates is now the chair of neurosurgery at Vanderbilt. And he did a combination of something we also recommend, interdisciplinarity. You don't have to have a major now. You can put your own major together. He did a combination of biochemistry, enough to go to med school, and philosophy. Okay? Because he was interested in the ethical questions and religion and how that could fit together. And he got to Hopkins after UMBC. Now he is the chair of neurosurgery, but he tells people this. And he's pediatric neurosurgery. He says, when I have to tell parents that their child may be brain damaged, it's not the biochemistry that gives me the compassion and the language to talk to those parents. It is having struggle with the challenges of humankind that can give me the kind of humility to say to parents something that can be devastating. And I want you to think about that even in a STEM achievement conference. Think about how the humanities and the social sciences fit. Because right now, let me just say this, um, in many states, you don't have to go to the route of even of going to of calculus, you can go statistics. Statistics is going to be more and more important throughout the social sciences. I listened this morning on the, on the TV, um, Good Morning America, and they were saying there's been a 15% increase in children with autism. Uh, now, the question is whether people are just becoming more sensitive and diagnosing it more. We know people of color are beginning to understand some of the symptoms. But to many Americans, already they were saying 15% of Americans have autism. You see, they heard there's a 15% increase, all right? And they just took that to mean 15% of Americans have. You get my point? So that we've not taught people to know when you say percent, you want to know what's the base. For example, we had, uh, it was amazing, I got all these letters of congratulations from college presidents because we had had a 100% increase in the number of, of women in our physics department. A 100% increase. I got at least 10 letters from presidents. Nobody said we went from one to two. All right. <laughs> and I had this ethical dilemma. Do I write back and say you really shouldn't be congratulating us? And my folks said, just say thank you, all right? But I'm saying that I'm, my point is that when we think about STEM, it's not just about whether you can do geometry or whether you can do science. It's about fundamental living. I was working at Chair the Marguerite Casey Foundation in Seattle. We were working with my home state, Alabama, and, and the governor, a Republican governor, had recommended a billion dollars more for education, okay? best of the world of Republicans and Democrats working together as we want to have it and amazingly the lobbying people did not want it to pass and they frightened poor whites and blacks because it was going to be a property tax increase but the property tax was so low that the small increase would have meant a few dollars and somehow they scared them into thinking it was going to make them almost bankrupt and they didn't vote for their own children just because they didn't understand that that small increase on a small base, you get my point? Just means a few dollars, and so they, they voted against the education for their children. So we need to think about STEM, not only in terms of producing the professionals, but about how we can be good citizens and use statistics in all that work. And then the, the other part I want you to think, and I'm gonna stop so we can have questions, is the notion of analytics. How many of you are using analytics right now? How many of you use analytics? Analytics meaning the, the use of, of statistics and computing to understand the trends in performance, okay? So the idea that the question is being able to disaggregate data, because you, it's not enough to say 60% are doing well. You need to know women, men. You need to know black, white, Asian, Hispanic. You, need, you have to disaggregate the data because people respond in different ways. Just one example. It's not enough to say, well, women don't do well in STEM. That's not true. Women do well in STEM when given the opportunity. So we have as many women graduating with degrees in math, undergrad, as we have men at this point. But when you get to technology, we have another situation. In the 80s, we'd gotten up to a third of all students graduating with degrees in computer science being women, 36%, really. What percent of the degrees today, bachelors, are going to women? What do you think? 
is we thought we'd get to 50% by now. Since we were in 36 in the 80s, we're down to 20%. Why? We stopped emphasizing funding for girls in technology in K through 12. And you don't solve a 100 year problem in 10 years. And, and, and now let me just give you one application of that. Um, most of the women in my graduate program from computer science come from other countries. They come from China and India and Russia, okay, at a time when we're being hacked all the time. And this is what the intelligence community knows. Now how many of you know that men don't know how women think? <laughs> If you're married, you really know that. Women know, I know women know that. <laughs> I mean, we, we really don't. I mean, women know us. I've been married 45 years. Give my wife a round of applause. I've, 45 years. And she knows exactly me. But I'm always still trying to figure her out sometimes. But here's my point. So if in other countries, women are experts in hacking and cyber, and all of our experts are men, then we got a, we got a big problem. We don't understand how Russian women think. We don't, you get my point? You know, in other countries, you know, and, and, and so the idea of producing more people with the coding, with computing, with hacking, of all races, of all colors, will be more important than ever. And last point, and I'm gonna stop for questions. Last point is this. We have to stop thinking that some children are smart and others are just there. The more you just talk about the smart children, the more you make other people feel they're very ordinary. And there's no challenge greater for a teacher than giving that child a sense of self, to believe that he or she can do it, regardless of race, gender, to let them know you can do this, okay? Uh, and, and, and I want you to think about that. The word that we use instead of smart, because I'm not sure what it means. My youngest freshman, believe it or not, on my campus ever was nine years old. I get a lot of children through the, the, the calculus sequence before they're 13. Still don't call them. They, they have some gifts, yeah, but those children work really hard. They were homeschooled. They work really hard. The word we have to use that we, the name of my Chesapeake Bay Retriever on my campus is True Grit. And we say UMBC is the house of grit. Okay? And what is the point? Have your children define that word grit. It's hard work. It's resilience. It's perseverance. It's never, never, never giving up. It's all those things. I mean, it makes all, you know, amazing. if you had seen my little kid, my guys doing that basketball, and I never thought I'd be talking about basketball in the middle of math, and yet, it, you know, you had this wonderful basketball team with all that money could buy. UVA, wonderful school, $9 billion, all right? The best ever. You can, when you got $9 billion, you can get the best, all right? And then you got my great guys who, who are really good in the classroom, all right, who play basketball, all right? Two of whom had 4.0s. What quality did they have? Grit. They had a sense of self. They understood that you don't have to be rich to be the very best. Give me a round of applause for that idea that you don't have to be rich to be the very best, okay? And with all due respect to the other institutions, and they just kept going and going and going. That grit makes the difference. At the end of my mama's life, she came, we brought her to, from Birmingham to Baltimore, and all of a sudden I realized that this brilliant woman who taught 40 some years had developed dementia. You don't want to see your mama going down. And, and we're sitting out on the porch one day, and she looked at me, and I knew she didn't even know who I was. You know, when you get that dementia, they know you're familiar, but they don't know you. And she said, I know the end is near. You don't want to hear your mama say that. And I said, so what's important to you? And she gave me the best gift of my life. She said, and I give it to you. She said, what's important? She said, and she could tell I was about to cry. She said, first and foremost, relationships. My relationship with my God. Amen. She said, hold on to your faith. You'll be okay. And then she said, my relationship with my husband. He's a wonderful man. She'd forgotten daddy had died. And then she shocked me. She looked right in my face and she said, and I'm an only child, right? She said, I have a, I have a son. And all of a sudden, my, my grief turned to anger. I'm thinking, this woman has had a baby when she was a teenager and never told me about it. And now she's going to drop that bomb in my lap and I'm going to have a brother that I don't want, all right? And I'm saying, don't you do that. Don't you do me like that. It's TMI. I mean, I'm looking evil. Don't you mess me up like this now. Wait a minute. And she looked at me and she said, he's a college president. Thank God she was talking about me. She said, <laughs> but then she said this, and here's my gift to you. She said, teachers touch eternity through their students. Teachers 
touch eternity through this. Whatever I had to give, my sense of right and wrong, my belief in those children, I will always live through them. I went back and spoke in Birmingham and all these people got up, these teachers got up, got up and they said, you know, your mama didn't teach me how to read. She taught me to love to read. But then she went to my house in the projects and told my grandmama, let this child go to college, become an independent woman first, get a job then get a husband, then have children, amen. And I went just, to, and amazingly, amazingly, they all said, but she changed our lives. You have that opportunity. In the most frustrating of situations, you never know when you're touching a young person in a way that will make a difference for the rest of their lives. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. But your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are when you don't think anybody can see you when your mama's not there. What will you do, right? So thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become character. But your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Arkansas, you're such a special place. And you, like the rest of us, can be even better. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so some questions. Thank you. Very good. Good. Girl. I can tell you a lot of math people. You got the thinking look on math and science. Uh huh. Give me some questions. Got time for some questions? And somebody is coming up. I. I. Robbie, the Nobel laureate. This is a great story you like. I. I. Robbie, a Nobel laureate in, the phys in physics in the 40s said, when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' mothers would ask them at the end of a school day, what you learned in school? He said, not my Jewish mother. He said, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the encouraging of his curiosity made him the thinker he became. I want you, my big challenge is to first ask good questions yourselves what can we do to change things? How do we get students more inspired? But then to encourage the young people because that's how you get into STEM or in life. You've got to be curious enough to ask the good questions. First question. Yes, sir. Mark. Yes. 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 Great. Mark was my driver, and I know he has five daughters, and he told me something that was really great. He said, you know, I have turned that TV off, and I'm doing much more reading. Give him a round of applause for that idea. I like, I like that. He wants to be that teacher. I like that. Uh, uh, he asked, what can we do to get greater connection between um, the, uh, higher ed and, uh, the higher ed institutions and K-12? And I want people to still, I want you to really talk about pre-K-12. through 12. It's very important. All the new research shows more than ever that through neuroscience that that child's brain and ability to think will be heavily, 70-80% formed before that child is five. And so it's not just warm and fuzzy and play stuff. It is about critical thinking skills and, and interacting and vocabulary and things. So we have to start saying pre-K through, through, through 12. This is what I would say. Number one, I do think that people who are going to be teachers need opportunities to work with children well before they are talking about some kind of, and, and it's, it's of course in some of the classes, but the more we can have tutoring in math and reading with children as young as possible and reflecting on those experiences, the better it is. And working not only on the math and reading, but on all the challenges that our children face when they come to, come to us from difficult situations is very important. The math and reading are at the base of the practice exam. Somebody who is with very good reading skills uh, and who does well on ACT or SAT, that will be a very high correlation quickly on the practice exam. One of the reasons, one of the reasons that we have fewer people of color is that we not supported students in learning how to take the standardized test and do well. And this is why from HBCUs to others that are a downturn in the numbers because of not being able to pass that first is that practice one. And my argument is, yes, we should use online work, but I think it's very important with the online work to have facilitators who can work with the people because you learn to do by doing. And so the math problems, using the online, but having facilitators to help with that. And then you learn to read and understand passages by doing it. You learn, you look at the questions first, and then you know what you're looking for, and then you go to the passage. You know, you, there's some techniques you use. So in strengthening your math skills and reading, it's the idea of having somebody to work with you. And that's, that's for people who are going to be teachers, that's for children. That's, and, and one of the challenges, how many of you teach high school? Let me see that, teach at the high school level. How many of you teach at the elementary, K through eight level? 
And one of the things I want to say is the idea of having support for teachers at every level, particularly in middle school and, and before, to give them chances to think about different approaches to solving problems. Because some children can solve it one way. There are several ways to solve the problem I gave you. One of the things I do with kids who are anywhere from about 9 or 10 all the way up is to have them act out. The, the problem I just gave you, you know, with the 29, let them act it out. The 29 kids have 20, and, they, and I say, well, how can you do it? And they finally come up with the idea, well, let's put D on, 10, on 20 pieces of paper and tape it to them, all right? And then we're going to have 15 with cats C, right? And then you line them up, 10, 10, 9, and then you look and see what the interaction is, and you begin to talk about it and let them fight about it and talk about it. I mean, it's not just about getting the answer. It is about the process of thinking. I am, one of the challenges that math teachers have is this. You know how to solve it one way. But you need time and help in knowing how to solve it several ways. Because it, and it takes just more conversations and the time to think about, well, these kids got it this way, these got it this way, how do we put those two things together? And so even if somebody got the answer to the problem I had, I would give you uh, an A, but I wouldn't give you an A+. Plus. To get the A+, plus, you have to tell me, how do you help a 12-year-old solve it without giving her the answer? Okay, there's the problem in American math. We tend to plug in and give answers as opposed to figuring out ways of asking questions that can have children struggling with it. That's building that muscle of the ability to have critical thinking skills. Very, very important. Next question. Somebody, please. Yes. Um, here in Arkansas, yeah? I, I don't sound like an Arkansan. Right. I'm pretty new. Okay. okay. I noticed that we have a lot of special challenges. Um, heteronormativity is like an animal. So I feel like the LGBTQ community yes. Yes. and people who are not Protestants, yes. <laughs> yes. they have a special challenge here. Yes. To yeah, sure. I, you know, and I, and I can say this. I'm on a campus that really values all kinds of people. Uh, one of the things that came out of the 60s was at the beginning of thinking that uh, people could come from different backgrounds. Even, you know, you may not know this, but in 19, in the early 60s when uh, John Kennedy was elected, people were really, really upset that there was a Catholic elected. It was very interesting. Even though he's from a wealthy family, it was, that was just that kind of prejudice about Protestants and Catholics, right? You start there, and then you get to the issues of that women have only been voting since the 20s. Suffrage, it's amazing. It's not even been 100 years. And then you think about blacks and the Alabama literacy, they're all in the 60s. And then until just, re it's only been in the more recent years that we have become more enlightened as a human society to understand that people have very different backgrounds when it comes to sexual orientation, when it comes to how they want to live their lives and it comes to who they love and we can be very judgmental you know I was in a legislature I was at and a group of black ministers came up to me they were fighting the idea of, of, uh, of gay marriage and and they said well you're a Christian and they, they had a TV camera and they wanted to say tell them this is wrong and I said I couldn't do that and I said this from the Bible um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you I have the right to love my wife Okay, and marry her. I think every human being has the right to make that decision. Give me a round of applause for that idea that people have the right to decide what they want to do. You know, and when those who are so self-righteous come up with this idea where it's, it's wrong and everything else, I mean, we got a problem with marriage. It's 60 some percent of Americans who are with hetero are, are, are divorced right now. You know, and the Bible talks about divorce. I mean, and I'm not judging at all. I'm just saying, let's not be so self-righteous is my point. If we can get away from being self-righteous and get that, if we are Christians, and on my campus we got Muslims and Jews and, and Hindus, all types. And I'm always saying we want to respect every kind. My own foundation is, 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 is Christianity. But I mean, in our own faith, there's that notion that somehow uh, we ought to love our neighbor and try to understand that point, person's point of view. And I think it takes time. We're all products of our own experiences. And it takes time. I mean, I was so proud of my own state as it made some decisions in some elections lately because it took time for people of all races to decide how they wanted to vote on things. And I'm not I'm just saying because, I mean, it is wrong to talk about disrespecting women. Give me a round of applause for that idea. It is wrong to talk about disrespecting women. Why am I saying it? Because it is a problem. It really is. And so we have to say it. And I need to say it as a math teacher. Because you see, math and science are not just objective. Even when talking about science, we bring out prejudices to the work. I'll give you one example. Why do you think until the late 60s, all of the money going for cancer went to prostate cancer? 
and almost none to breast cancer. Why do you think that was the case? Because there were men in power. And even the scientists were saying, the serious problem is prostate cancer. Why? Because they might get it. And Congress was that. It was only when you started having women scientists that they started questioning and having other studies. I was just at a, a place that, you know, under 1% right now of the scientists at NIH are black. Under 1%. Even in the billions of dollars for health disparities for blacks and Hispanics, under 1%. You know, and when I hear scientists saying, and the study, they come up with results, and you've not taken those people into account, and the challenges that they face, we have that underrepresentation uh, under problem. So my point is that we have to understand there are differences among us. We should respect those differences. We're all children of God, right? People have the right to be religious or spiritual or whatever they want to be. From my perspective, I am saying that we as people in STEM areas have to begin talking with our children about how to think critically. How to think critically and come to conclusions. It's a good question that you ask with great courage. Give a round of applause for the, for the question. Okay, last question, last question. Yep. Somebody, one last question, yes. 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 Right, right, right. Right. Yes. And you know, um, uh, when we had the Freddie Gray uh, riots in Baltimore, my campus is outside of the city. We're we are, you know, when people were calling and saying, are your students safe when they were having the Freddie Gray riots? And I said, the only, only problem on our campus is construction. I mean, because, I mean, we're out with 600 acres, right? It, the difference between the halves, I mean, it's just amazing. We're out in the suburbs, not at BWI Airport, but my students were going in to, to try to help children there because we supervise 500 little boys of color and some poor white boys 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the city. These are first-time nonviolent offenders, okay? And my students from pre-med to pre-law, all the areas, all races, work with these children. And my students expected faculty to talk about what was happening in in Baltimore, because we're right outside the city. And so the people in the social sciences were doing it, but my STEM people were saying, we, we haven't been trained to do this. So what we ended up doing was to have professional development, to give people of all races a chance to learn how you facilitate discussions to talk about some of the questions, and to understand this is not about being warm and fuzzy. This is about how you connect to people to pull them into the work. That's my TED talk, it takes, it takes math and stuff to pull people into the work. You gotta have people to do it. And high expectations, you gotta understand the backgrounds of those children. For example, you cannot tell me that my black students are doing this well if you don't tell me what, what the backgrounds of the students are. Some may be middle class, some may be first in their family to go to college, some may have parents from the islands or from Nigeria, others from Alabama, Mississippi, and there are differences even within one race. Okay, you know, and so my point is having opportunities for conversations where people can say what they really think and not be attacked. It's very important. So on my campus, my college Democrats, college Republicans, college progressives all have these sessions, <clears throat> and many of them are in science and engineering, are sessions in involving really sticky issues, and there's one principle that I want to leave you with. It is this. We must learn to agree to disagree agreeably. Did you hear that? Learn to agree, to disagree agreeably. The only way you can have the kind of conversations you're talking about if people think they can say whatever they really think. And it may not sound good, but we need to know what's on somebody's heart so we can at least examine it and be supportive of them in understanding what needs to happen. Stand up, everybody. I got to get you to do this quote with me. Come on, stand up, stand up, get up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Breathe deeply. Mindfulness is important. And I'm telling you already, I'm going to give you a test on it as soon as I do it. Okay, repeat after me. Thoughts. Thoughts, words, words actions, actions, habits, habits character, character, destiny. destiny. Again, thoughts, thoughts words, words, actions, actions habits, habits, character, character destiny. destiny. Okay, watch your thoughts, they become your words. Uh, some of y'all knew it, some of y'all didn't. Now you know what I'm going to do, right? <laughs> this is what I mean by test. You've got to be mindful what's expected, right? Now you know I'm going to call out one, you're going to do the other. So this time when you hear us do it together, you're going to really be mindful and know it. And then once we do it, it'll be powerful. Watch this. Thoughts. Words, words, actions, actions habits, habits, character, character destiny. destiny. Here's your test. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your Action. Watch your actions, they become your Ah, uh, 
minus, somebody got a C minus on that one. Watch your, watch your thoughts, they become your? Well, let's start again. Watch your thoughts, they become your? Watch your words, they become your? Watch your actions, they become your? Watch your habits, they become your? Character becomes your? A plus, and thank you all very much. Thank you.